there we go. We are recording. Is recording the right screen? All right. So a few items to talk about first. If you go to the announcements, I just made a bunch here this morning. Um, okay. So I got the gray distribution, you know, done, and I forgot to put one. You know, I'm gonna just you know talk about it a little bit. Um, okay. So let me get there. Prof tag, and this is the correct one. <laughs> it's titled "What to Do After the First Midterm or Exam." So, depending on what grade you're getting, you know, some people may not be may not need any concerns whatsoever, and other people may need to pay some attention to you know what they do for the rest of the semester. So, I will share this one with you know all of you um, in the announcements, so that way you can read it. You know. As you have time, so I'm just going to put it here. What to do after exam one and publish, share, basically. All right. So, a few things. Uh, just a recap of you know the importance of time budgeting, which basically translates to: Do you have you know two hours to spend for every hour in lecture? This classroom. Okay. Now, some people may not need all two hours, and some people may need slightly more than two hours. So you know how you study. Okay. You know how much you understand the material in this class. So you kind of have to make a gauge. You know, you have to gauge how much time you need. Uh, time allocation. Once you have a budget, you still need to decide when am I going to spend some time you know, to study for this class. Um, you know, particularly over the weekend, I think it's really important because otherwise you have four or five days, you know, you know, without any actual mentioning or contact with this material. So studying you know, over the weekend is important. Note taking, okay, this is actually a very important thing um, because you know um, I did a little bit of research and found that you know most people have a short term memory of about seven items when they are familiar things like names that you're familiar with. Or digits or numbers and stuff like that, but in this class, okay, things are not the things that you are familiar with. So in that case, it it can drop down to like about four, which means your short term memory can only track about four things for twenty seconds. <laughs> If something happens within those twenty seconds that distracts you, poof, gone. Okay, so that means if you want to understand something. You need to retain all of those items and then make connections between those items. So you need to do all of that within 20 seconds. When I am just yapping all the time, okay. So that's not going to be easy. Jotting down notes is the key to be successful, because when you jot down notes, you know you have it on writing, then you can visually see what you have just written down, and you can always review it later. So that means you know, even though your short-term memory cannot track as many items as you would like, you know, a piece of paper with a pencil can help tremendously in this case. So I just want to kind of push that a little bit.、Uh, being in class and on time, you know, are also important. At least from my perspective, it is important because it is providing structure to some people who kind of need the structure, myself included. Okay. So there are a few items here that are kind of you know, there. I would say they're no brainers.、Uh, try to be on time because somebody who's late by 15 minutes is not just waiting, wasting 15 minutes. That person may be wasting the entire class period because if, if they miss the first 15 minutes, and I talk about things, then the, when that person arrives in the classroom, those concepts are not going to connect anymore. Okay, so they lost not that person is not losing just the fifteen minutes, but basically the entire class period, which to me is not a good deal. Okay, you're just you know missing fifteen minutes, you end up losing eighty minutes. All right, so just you know little things you know that I think you know people can try to consider in order to improve their grade from here on.、Um, I also made a tool. Okay, like there are two reasons why I mentioned this. One is You can use it, okay? You know, you can use it, you know, however you want to. So you know, as usual, the tool itself is really just、uh, a spreadsheet,、um, and the spreadsheet has three tabs that you can see. There are well four tabs, including the click tab, 
So there are three tabs that you can see other, other than the click tab. So this one is about concept, and you can see that I'm using this class as an example. So we have you know, concepts like transistors, p-type transistors, n-type transistors, NAND gates, AND gates, OR gates, and then we move down to the R. So single digit sum for addition, the carry, uh, Q of I, K of I plus one, and so on. And then you have relations. In other words, how do the concepts relate to each other? Understanding a concept or understanding material in a class is not about memorizing. It is about making connections, especially logical connections in this class between the concepts, okay? So that's why you have to kind of focus on you know, how concepts relate to each other. Some concept depends on another concept. Some concept is a component of another concept. Some concept can potentially lead to another concept. Some concept specializes into another concept, and so on, okay? And you can also use um, mathematical notation if you want to, using the double dollar sign to begin and using the double dollar sign to also end the uh, equation. Uh, some concepts can be defined in a mathematical notation, okay? So you have a description of something, and then you can say, oh, but it is defined as blah, blah, blah. So this is... All, you can change all of these, okay? You can delete every single, single one here, and then you can you know, delete every single one here, add your own, do whatever you want, okay? It's just a spreadsheet. The most important tab is the connection tab. So the connection tab uses your know, drop-down boxes, so this way you don't need to remember everything, so you just need to do a drop-down box and then look for the things, look for the concepts that are already defined, and so on. So if you don't like you know, what is already here, you can just go ahead and delete a bunch of them, select a bunch of rows, hit the delete key, and they're gone. Okay? So I'm, I'm, not, I'm, kind of, I'm going to keep all of these things here. So the best part of this is it will give you a visual presentation you know, of all the concepts and of, of all the connections. So if you go back to the click tab, there's a hyperlink here. And you click the hyperlink, you know, right here. You, it will open up. I mean, if you did it, you know, it's going to ask you for a bunch of permissions, okay? But it will give you a graph. This picture, this diagram, is only on things that we talked about up to and including binary addition. <laughs> All right. So I think this is visually telling people, you know, how the complexity of the concept that we are talking about in this class, okay? And that is why note-taking is particularly important, okay, because of the complexity. So um, you can use this tool, you can decide not to use the tool, okay? You can enhance the tool, everything is kind of open source, so you can go ahead and you know, either use it, not use it, you know, change it, make it more fancy, you know, it's up to you. You can apply this you know, to your other classes, or you can decide not to you know, think about it at all, okay? It's just a tool available to you. All right, so having said all that, we are gonna continue with the stuff that we need to talk about in today's class, because the lab, today's lab is gonna depend, depend on a few things that, we, that I need to talk about, okay? So we'll go ahead and go back to um, the share drive, okay, so let me go to the share the drive first. So by this time, I'm hoping that some of you have you know, already made a copy of the opcode table so that you can add your own comments and you know, add your own understanding to that particular table. If not, at least you have a shortcut to it, right? You know, because you probably need to re refer to it from time to time. So I'm just gonna go back to uh, the opcode table first. So here's the opcode table. So what we'll be concentrating on today are things that will either store something in memory, in RAM, or retrieve something in RAM. Okay, so those are the two kinds of instructions that we'll be focusing on. So if I were to highlight those instructions, one is called LDI, which is load immediate. One is called LD, which is just load. And then the, other, the last one is ST or store. So uh, these are the three rows that we are be, will be focusing on in today's lecture. All right, so do we have any questions about you know, what we are planning to do in today's lecture? Okay. 
So I see a whole bunch of people you know, who are already on the Octo page. So once again, you can go to File, and then make a copy. So this way, you know, you have a copy in your own drive, so that you can do whatever editing, commenting that you want to do. You know, enhance it, add another column. You know, it's up to you. <clears throat> All right. So of these three, we are going to start with. I'm going to start with LDI, which is actually one of the more complex instruction, because you know it is. If you look at the description or column C. Oh, by the way, what is column C. What is the language that we use in column C? We talked about it in the previous class. It starts with R. RTL, which stands for Register Transfer Language. Okay, so the name of the term RTL is not super duper important but it is important in the sense that you might see that in the future. If you need to work with um, any type kind of architecture at the assembly language level, at a low level, RTL is a fairly common way to describe an operation or what is happening when an instruction you know, executes. All right, so in this case, okay, there are two ways to describe it. The first way to describe it is x equals to the dereference of PC++. So now you have to remember what is the asterisk, what is it doing, and when we have plus plus after a register, basically it's a variable, what does it mean? It is post increment. So dereferencing, post increment, and you know those two concepts from CISP 360 are particularly important in the in this particular instruction. So the next thing we will do is we're going to assemble a very simple program just to illustrate you know, how this works. So what we'll do is I can use the assembler, but I can also hand assemble something. So I am going to hand as hand assemble in this case. Let me go to um, Mouse pad. This is from my other class. You'll forget about this. We're gonna we'll get a new uh, document here. So what we want to do is to say I want to do an LDI um, C with forty five. Okay. This is the mnemonic, which is column B. So in this case, what we want to do is really just to load the constant of forty five, which is in decimal into register C, okay? In other words, okay, what this really is doing is to say, okay, we want register C to become 45 in decimal, and 45 in decimal is what in hexadecimal, because the only thing we can see in the registers are all in hexadecimal. So can someone tell me what is 45 in hexadecimal, in base 16? In other words, right, go ahead. 2D, 2D very good. So because it is 2 times 16, you know, which is 32, after we take out 32, there's a 13 left. 13 is the letter D. So by knowing that 2 times 16 plus 13 is 45 in decimal, that tells me that the you know, 2D is indeed the hexadecimal representation. Okay, so good job you're doing the conversion that quickly. Obviously, you can also have calculators, online calculators that can do this for you. But I think going through this, at least mentally, you know, using mental math with a piece of paper a few times is going to be beneficial. Understanding how to do something, even though there are tools to do it already, I think is increasingly important. The reason why I said that is because you know, with AI tools, you really don't have to think when you are in a community college, lower division classes, you really do not have to think. Um, I think Chat GPT can be easily an A student for basically every single class that you have to take. So if your if you if your mindset is if the tool can do it, I don't have to do it. I just let the tool do it. You can end up learning zero, nothing from college. But it's only going to hurt later on. So my recommendation is to do everything that you possibly can so that you learn how to do things despite there are tools that can do it for you already. At least do it a few times so that you understand how to get it done. 
then you let the tool do it because it's faster. All right, cool. So, <clears throat> so let's go ahead and assemble this code and see what it looks like in the assembler. So the assembler is in the processor folder. Okay, I made this one you know kind of stay on top all the time, so that's why it's not feeling that way. So we go to the assembler, we go to the source tab, and then we you know I have to delete this code and then to write the code that I was just mentioning, which is LDIC comma 45. So it might take a little bit of time, especially depending on your computer speed and stuff like that. You know, you might see your know, messages like loading, dot, 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 you know, that might stay for a little bit. But when we go to the assemble tab, we can see that this instruction takes up two bytes. 6E is the actual opcode, and then 2D is, oh wait, 2D, we remember that 2D, it is what, it's 45. So as it turns out, the constant or the, the, the value that we want to load into register tree is the second byte of this instruction. Okay, the first byte is 6E, the second byte is 2D. So let's go back to the opcode table and find out why we have 6E in this case. We are talking about the LD instruction, which is this row here. This is the binary bit counter. 0, 1, 1, 0, 3, power 6. So 1, 1 is always going to be there. I need to specify register C. Can somebody remind me, you know, uh, what is register C in bit pattern? 1, 0. Very good. So that means the, the least significant for this would be 1, 1, 1, 0, which is E in hexadecimal. So that's why 6E is the actual opcode. The second byte is not, quote unquote, a part of the opcode. It is the constant that we want to store in register C. Are we good so far? Okay. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is to actually go ahead and run this in Logisim. So this is an exercise that I recommend everybody to do at least a few times, okay? It will look and feel overwhelming you know, the first few times, but then after that, you know, it should get a lot, a, a little bit easier. Um, and it will help, this is basically how this material should be studied, okay? It's really just to run through these, these instructions by hand um, so that you understand how things work out in the processor. So I just load it in, and for a program as simple as this, I'm just going to put it in like this. 6E, oh, I'll click it first. So 6E is um, the opcode, and then the constant is a 2D right here. So now we are ready to execute the instruction. As I have mentioned in previous classes, once we have talked about the fetch and the decode process, I'm not going to explain those concepts you know, in detail anymore. So the first rising edge is the fetch. The, set, the falling edge is doesn't really have a name because all it does is to increment the microcode pointer. And then the next rising edge increments the PC or the program counter. So if you look at the program counter, it would increment to 0, 1, like so. And then the next falling edge is the decode. So you can see how we now... Um, the ROM is addressing location 6E0. So in other words, decoding for this processor is super simple. Whatever the opcode is, had a zero to its right-hand side, it becomes the address that we need to get to in the, um, in the decode field, in the decode range. So now we are up for another um, rising edge again, I think. Yep, we are up for, up for another rising edge. This is when we have to slow down, okay? Because you know, the ex this is the execute cycle, by the way. This is the execute cycle slash phase when we're executing an instruction. In other words, what we're gonna do next depends on the instruction, okay? So this is where we're gonna slow down and we go back up to the processor and we look at the five components you know, and see which one is active and then we'll do the analysis accordingly. Well, the first one is we see the register bank has a bright green line going into it. So that means something in the register bank is about to update, okay? So that means, you know, if you are tracking this yourself, it is a good idea to kind of jot down some notes and just to, you know, remember that this is something that we have to look further into. So I'm just gonna you know, write this down. Input enable of the register bank is one, okay? So I'm just gonna remember this 
and I will even make a note here and say that some register in the register bank is about to be updated. Okay, now obviously you can write something that's shorter and more concise, but you know, you know, just whatever you want to do, you know, track it. So we scan again, you know, to other components and see if anything else is active. Ooh, look at RAM. RAM goes like, ooh, we are busy, we are doing stuff. So the RAM has select you know, one, which means it is enabled. LD is the one which means we are reading from RAM, which automatically says, oh, we have some additional questions to ask, but we'll ask those questions in a little bit. So we, we're gonna say your know, cell of RAM, or let's just say RAM cell is one. Um, we also know that RAM LD is also one we are reading. So we'll follow up with some additional questions in just a little bit. Then we have to look for the other ones, okay? You know, there are like three more registers that we need to kind of examine. Look at the program counter. It is also enabled. Okay, so let's you know, put that on the list, okay? So now we say pc.en is a one. So the program counter is about to be updated. PC is about to be updated, okay? And then we look at the instruction register. The instruction register in the execute phase really should not change, okay? You know, there, there's no reason for us to change the instruction register because it's, it's as long as we are not following up with a decode, the instruction, the content of the instruction register really is not that useful. So for the most part, we don't update the instruction register. Then the last one that we want to take a look at is the flags register, which is right next to the ALU. So we look at that one, which is right here. This is the flags register. It is not enabled. It is not going to be updated. So we just kind of leave it alone in this case. All right. So of all the things that we know that are active, you know, we now have to ask a secondary question because if some register in the register bank is about to be updated, don't you think we have some additional questions to ask? So what question do, should we ask next now that we know some register is going to be updated? Yeah, which one is update, being updated? Okay, so we ask you which one, okay? So the, re the way I ask these questions is probably more important than the actual answer to the question. A lot of times you know, the question itself is much more important. So we can see how register C is the only one with an enable being a one. Everything else has the enable being a zero. So this is how we know that register C is the one that is about to be updated. Okay, cool. Okay, we'll just kind of make a note here. So we say register one, register C is about to be updated because register input select is a one zero. This one here, okay? It's one zero in base two, so let me just emphasize that we're dealing with base two. So when we go back to the outside of the chip, we can now start to see, but who is determining which chip or which uh, register is gonna be updated? In other words, we're looking at RISEL, register input select. And we ask, who is driving the value of this tunnel? Well, as it turns out, this one is coming straight from the ROM, so there's no additional things we need to do because you know, uh, R-I-E-N and R-I-S-E-L are both coming from microcode data, and microcode data comes straight out of the output of the ROM, so that means, eh, okay, that's just exactly how the ROM is trying to specify things. There are, there's no further explanation needed. Are we good so far? Okay. So let me go uh, put this back into the projector so, and, and ask, so what else should we ask? Now that we know register C is about to be updated, what would be the next natural question to ask? Knowing that register C is about to be updated. Um, okay, so, uh, so your answer was, uh, how, what is this going to be updated to? Or you can also ask, who is supplying the value to update register C? Okay, very good. 
So now we want to track that down. In other words, we go back into the register bank first, okay, and then we analyze the circuit. And after doing this a few times, you probably don't need to go back into the register bank to figure, figure that part out. So register C is about to be updated, and the only way to specify the value to update register C is to track down what connects to port D of the register. Port D of the register is coming straight from reg in, okay? So now we have to track down, okay, who is specifying the value to reg in? Now, if you do not know the layout of the pins of the chip, then you probably can go to RegBank, okay? And go to RegBank here, right click and look at the appearance, because what we need to figure out is, um, where is that pin? Well, it is actually this pin here, because you can click on the pin in the appearance and the matching actual input pin in the detailed part of the circuit is going to be highlighted in the picture in pink here. So this is how we can double check and verify. Oh, okay, so this still pin over here is corresponding to this pin over here. So if I go back into the details, okay, let me go back into the register bank here. Now we know that this thing here is specifying the, the input to the whole thing, but from the outside perspective, we are looking at this particular, this particular port over here. Okay, so what we need to do next is to figure out uh, what is routed you know, to this particular pin. Well, it's coming from a multiplexer. The multiplexer is enabled, okay? So that is important because if the multiplexer is not enabled, then we go like, um, that's kind of meaningless because you know, if the multiplexer is not enabled, then you know, what is going you know, to that input port? But it is enabled. So now if it is enabled, we look at the select the select is a dark green, which is a zero. So now we know input zero of this multiplexer connects to its output. And that goes whew, a lot of places. Of all the places that it goes, it also goes to RAM, okay? So this is where we can go like, oh, okay. So whatever thing we are reading from RAM, okay? We already know that we are reading from RAM because RAM load is a one. So now we make that connection. It's like, okay, whatever we, we are reading from RAM is being used to update register C. Are we doing okay so far with that analysis? Okay. So I'm going to jot this down. Okay, I'm going to write some note here and go like, okay, so um, register C dot D, okay, port D of RAM, of, of the register connects to RAM dot D. In other words, whatever we are reading from RAM is used to update register C. Okay, that is important. Okay, we're cool here. So now the next question is, um, okay, so let me, let me keep the screen on. What would be the next natural question? Now that we know register C is going to be updated, um, the output of RAM is being used to update register C. RAM is selected, it is active. What is the natural next question to ask? Hmm? Sorry? Okay, so we kind of know where it's reading from because RAM you know, has that location highlighted. Okay, so we know it's reading the 2D from location 0, 1. And what would be the next question to ask? Why are we reading location 0, 1? Okay, so, so now we ask why are we reading location hexadecimal 0, 1? That's the question, okay? We know we are reading location zero, 01. That part is pretty easy to figure out. But why are we reading that location? Who is, what mechanism determines what location we are reading in RAM? If you just look at the RAM component itself, which port will tell us which location we are reading? Port A. Port A, very good, okay. So that means we now need to know who really connects to port A. So now we look at port A, we highlight this wire, and goes like, okay, who is telling me 
to read from location zero one. So you can see that this is coming out of a multiplexer. This multiplexer does not have an enable pin, which means it is always enabled. So the select is a one, which means you know, we now need to track down input one, because when a multiplexer has a select of one, it is connecting input one to the output. So now we track this one down. This one doesn't really go to too many places, especially when you consider the output of something, because it's coming straight out of the program counter. So this is also why the program counter needs to be incremented as soon as we have fetched the opcode, because we might actually have use of the program counter to grab a second byte associated with an instruction. Okay? So now that the program counter is at zero, one, okay, we make that connection. So that means, you know, I'm going to go back to my notes here and just kind of add to it, okay? So we, I say that ram.a connects to the program counters in Q port, which is the output. So this is why we can say, oh, okay, we are doing this. In fact, we can even conclude that we are doing this because we know that the program counter is acting as a pointer because it connects to the A port of RAM. So the location, the value of the location that we are reading is being connected to the input of register C. So in RTL, this is the most concise way to describe what we have figured out up to this point. The program counter is connected to the A port of RAM helping us to decide which location we are reading. The content of that location presented to the D port of RAM is routed to the D port of register C inside the register bank, and therefore we can make the conclusion that register C is going to be updated based on whatever the program counter is pointing to in RAM. Are we, are we doing okay so far with this discussion? Okay. Now, if I did not write down everything here, and this is my first time working with this processor, I would have been lost, okay? So that means you know, when you are doing this, and I hope, I hope, certainly hope that you're gonna do this on your own as a practice, because if you're not doing it, uh, the second exam is gonna be quite challenging. Yes? So going on with Now that we understand, or at least I assume, that we understand you know, how multiplexers, demultiplexers, registers, RAM, and ROM, they all operate individually, it is a matter of figuring out together what are they doing, okay? So that's what we are doing here. All right, but there's one more thing we need to track down, because the program counter itself is getting updated too, because the enable of the program counter is a one, so the program counter is about to update too. So what is the next natural question to ask now that we know the program counter is about to update? Whenever something is gonna update, the natural question is, who is supplying the value to update it? Which means we track down the D port of the program counter, it's coming out of a multiplexer, this multiplexer has, is always enabled because there's no enable pin here. The select is from PC Mux. Now, unlike PCEN and a few other tunnels that we have already talked about, PC Mux is not coming out of the ROM directly. PC Mux is coming out of the cascaded you know, multiplexer here. So this is PC Mux, okay? So now the question is, why is PC Mux a zero? Okay, so what would be the next? Next question to ask, now that we know the output of this multiplexer is a zero, what question are you going to ask next? How does a multiplexer work? What does it do? Okay, I'm assuming that you know the answer to those questions already. And if you don't, then you have material to review. I know it sounds like I'm nagging. I wish I'm not nagging. I, don't, I wish I do not have the need to nag. Okay, but you really should know 
what a multiplexer is and how it works. So the multiplexer works by using the select to select one of the input to connect to the output. Now, there's a whole bunch of zeros here, okay? In fact, out of the eight inputs, seven are zeros. So you go like, oh, okay, so that means that we are just picking up one of the seven zeros, done. My analysis is done. No, we have to know exactly which one we are selecting because we want to know why this is happening, okay? So that means the only means the only thing to answer that question is to look at PC mux mux. It is a five, okay, or one zero one. So that means of all the inputs of this particular multiplexer, input zero, one, two, three, four, five, this is the one that is connected to the output. That is why PC mux is a zero. All right. So this is I, what I expect you guys to be able to do is to track down the reason for everything. Then the next question that you might want to ask is, why is PC mux mux a 101? Well, that one turns out to be pretty easy to answer because PC mux mux comes out of here and then that comes out of microcode data and the microcode data is coming straight out of the ROM. So that simply is because of how the ROM is programmed. So there are no further explanations that you need to track because it is coming straight out of the ROM. Okay. All right. So now we have to go back and examine why, uh, what is, so this is a zero. So that means we have to track this down. This is an adder. Okay. In other words, we are looking at the PC adding one, which is PC plus one, that is going to update the program counter. So the program counter is about to update to 0, 2 in hexadecimal, and register C is about to be updated to 2D because that's the output coming from the RAM. So we got two things going on simultaneously. So let me go back to my notes here. I'm just going to add that explanation. So we're going to say your know, PC is about to be updated to just one more than what it has right now. So now it feels like that we are pulling the rug from under ourselves because on one hand, we are using the program counter to um, determine which location we are reading from RAM in order to update register C. At the same time, we are also implementing the program counter. So you might feel that, are we really grabbing whatever the program counter is pointing to right now and use it to update your register C? Or are we grabbing whatever it will be pointing to after the increment to update register C? So what do you think is the answer to that question? Or do you think it is undetermined because it kind of depends on which one is faster? So right now, okay, before the rising edge, right now, what is connected to the A port of RAM? What is the value being connected to the A port of RAM right now? Is it zero one? Or is it zero two? It's zero one. it's zero one because the program counter is currently at zero one. So that means you know, we are actually reading from location zero one and use the content of location zero one to update register C. Then your question is going to be, but what about this? We are incrementing the program counter, right? The answer is yes, we are, we are updating the program counter. So remember, the program counter is a register a register is a is the 8-bit version of an edge-sensitive um, edge-sensitive gated D flip-flop. Okay, a D flip-flop that is edge-sensitive has a whole bunch, like three SR latches in it. In addition to that, a few AND gates. Okay, all of those have propagational delay, which means Yes, the program counter will update to the program counter plus one, but it's going to take time. Okay, so that means you know when we are updating register C, it is being updated based on exactly what the program counter is pointing to at this point. Okay, now there's one more thing to this you know, argument. Um, RAM is very slow. If you change the address port of RAM from that moment to the moment that the, that the data port is going to update, 
do whatever the address point is specified, it takes a huge amount of time, okay? So that's why I don't have any concerns, okay? I'm really sure that register C is simply updating to the content at location 01, which is 2D, because I put that 2D in a little bit earlier. Are we good so far? All right, so um, now we go back to the circuit. Okay, let me go back to the circuit, because we got two things to observe right now, okay? Because one is we want to observe the program counter updating to 0, 2, but at the same time, let me see if I can actually see that. We can barely see it. We're going to see register C updating to 2D, which means we will observe register C to become 0, 0, 1, 0 for the 2, and then 1, 1, 0, 1 for the D. So register C is going to update. Uh, the program counter would also update. We can see over here too. This is also the program counter as a base two number. So this should update to 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. So both of those items will update at the same time on the next rising edge. So control T, bing. So they both got updated, okay? 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, that's our 2D. And then we have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, that's our 0, 2. Now, why do we want to upgrade, up, why do we want to increment the program counter? Because the next thing we're gonna do is to go back to location 0, 0, 0 for the microphone pointer for the next fetch. We don't want to fetch location 0, 1 as the next opcode because it, it, it is not the next opcode. The next opcode is at location 0, 3 of the RAM. Now, I didn't specify anything in location 0, 3 because I just wanted to demonstrate one single instruction. But if I had another instruction, another opcode specified, it will be at location 0, 3. So are we doing okay so far with this? Okay. And how long did we spend to, for this you know, analysis? Uh, about 40 minutes. Okay. So when you are doing this on your own, it might take you even longer. But that's okay. Because if I spent 40 minutes in class to do it, you should have allocated yourself 80 minutes to do the same thing. Yes, I keep going back to that you know, two to one ratio of your know, lecture time versus how much time you should spend outside of lecture. And I'm trying to tell you guys what you can do for those for that time that you're supposed to be allocating for this class and for all of your classes too, okay? So that is one thing that you can do is to go like, okay, let me just pretend that I did not you know, watch this lecture at all and I'm gonna do this on my own, okay? So try to replicate exactly these steps. All right, so let's go ahead and work with another instruction, which is the ST instruction. It is the only instruction that can change the content of a location in RAM. Okay, so the first thing we do is we go back to the opcode table. So the opcode table, as you probably can kind of see it right now, is super important, and that's why you know you might want to make a copy of this, just so that you can add your own notes here next to mine. Um, so the ST instruction is right here. Okay, this is your basic. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so when you look at the RTL, once again, what is RTL again? Exactly, very good, okay? Register transfer label. It specifies that we are using a register to specify which location in RAM to address and to change. And then we use another register, possibly the same register, to specify what we use, what is the content, what is the value to change that location to. Okay, so X and Y are both registers. Each one can be register A to D. They can be the same register, okay? There are some cases where you know, we don't need the register to retain its value as a pointer, so we can actually update it. No, I take it back. We can use the same register to specify the value of, the, the new value of the location in RAM, but we're using the same register to also point to which location we want to change in RAM. So this is what we're gonna do next, okay? Um, so what I will do is I am gonna give myself a, <clears throat> An example, so we will go ahead and say this is what we want to do. 
I want whatever register B is pointing to to become the value of whatever register B has. That's what I want to do. So now the next question is, what is the opcode corresponding to the operation that I just specified here? What is the opcode? So the opcode is column A. I know that 1111 has to be here, which is the F, okay? Because 1111 in binary is F in hexadecimal, okay? It's a 16. What I need to figure out is who is register X and who is register Y? Well, register Y is the one that is acting as a pointer. So this is my register Y. Register X, you know, the only job for register X is to provide a value to update the content in RAM. So now I have identified my Y and my X. So if register Y is B, what is YY? Y? It's 1, 1 in base 2. Very good. And if X is register B, what is XX as a binary number? 0, 1. Very good. So now we can put the whole thing together. Our opcode is 1, 1, 1, 1. Which is which I don't have a choice of because you know that's the constant part of the opcode, and then the xx is a zero one, and then a yy is one one. So when you look at this in hexadecimal, we have zero x, which is the prefix of a hexadecimal number. This is f seven. All right, so f seven it is. So we now switch to logisim, and right here. And I don't have any need for anything in the current simulation. So I go to simulate and reset the entire thing, including resetting the RAM. RAM is all back to zero again. So now we want to specify the opcode. Okay, so click on the location. We change it to F7. So now we, you know, we just have to go through the fetch and decode. And then we just have to kind of pause where we are about to execute the instruction. But the way it is right now is kind of funky because you know, um, both register D and register B are reset to zero. So we would end up overwriting location zero, zero, which is where the opcode is right now, to zero, zero. Okay? So do you guys want to watch that happen or do you want to change a specific location to a specific value? It's up to you guys. If you want to watch a program trash itself, the way it is right now would work. If you want to say, ah, oh, but I want you know, this location here to change to a specific value, we can do that too. It's up to you. Choose. In this case, there's no such thing as choose wisely. They all work. So. Hmm? Let's do the second option. Hmm? The second option. The second option? Okay, so which location do you want to change? Pick one. It doesn't even have to be something that is visible from here. Because you remember, RAM has 256 locations, so you can choose anything from 00, zero to FF in hexadecimal. Pick one. 88. Hmm? Eight, eight. Okay, so we want to change 88. Eight. So, so how do you want to change location 88 eight in hexadecimal? What is the other side? You want to change the value of 88 eight to... Since yes, hmm? A. Let the the letter A or eight. You need to specify two digits. Forty-two. Forty-two. Okay, so I like that. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> it's a little faster. <laughs> so four two in hexadecimal. Okay. So eight eight is kind of funny because you know um, Asian people like eight a lot because it, uh, it sounds like um, prosperity. You know, it's the, the character for prosperity um, has almost the same pronunciation as the numerical value of eight, but so is the action of growing, um, growing mode, okay? That's also, you know, also coincides with the sound of eight. So I just think it's funny. All right, so that's what we want to do, okay? So that means I need to put, you know, I need to initialize the registers to certain things in order for this to happen. So I go into the register bank and remind me again which one is acting as the pointer. Okay, I will give you guys a clue. Give me a second. 
All right, so the clue is right here. Oh, let's see. There we go. Okay. So which one should I put a 4-tooth into, and which one should I put 8 8 into? So let's start with the 4-tooth. B. Register B. Very good. Register B provides the value to change in RAM. So this is going to be a 4-tooth based on what we have discussed. So that means D is 8 8 because it's acting as a pointer to you know, specify which location we want to change in RAM. All right, so now we are all ready to go. And once again, we are going to fast track through the fetch and decode, and then we'll just pause at the execute. So control T, this is fetch. Oh, okay, why is this not working? Let me try again, control T. Yep, that's fetch. Increment the micro code pointer, auto increment the program counter, uh, and then now we have decode. And now we are about to, this is where we stop, okay? Because you know, we are now at the location F70 in the ROM, which means whatever this value is, is specifying all the all the bits going into the, the multiplexers, the multiplexers, blah, 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 and so on. So we're gonna do our analysis here. The register bank has no bright line going in. In other words, the input enable is a zero so that none of the registers is going to be updated. Does that match your expectation? None of the four registers A to D is about to update. Does that match your expectation? Yes, because we are not changing a register, we're changing what it points to, okay? So now we kind of slide on the other side a little bit. The flag register is disabled, it's not gonna update. Okay, cool, not a problem. And then you look at, you look at RAM, it's like, oh, RAM is being used. You know, we need to kind of make some note out of this. Okay, so we know that RAM is being selected, and we want to kind of document how it is going to be updated. Okay, so now this time we say RAM.cell is a one. It means, you know, RAM is being used, but there are two ways to use RAM. You can either be reading from RAM, which means the D port is an output, or you can be updating something in RAM, which means the D port is going to serve as an input. So the next thing we need to know is what is RAM load? RAM load is a zero this time, which means we are writing to RAM. We are updating a location in RAM. So uh, there are two natural questions to ask right now. You just have to pick one, okay? So just choose one of the two natural questions to ask now that we know RAM is being used and we are writing to RAM. Okay, go. What are the one of the two, give me one of the two natural questions to ask when we know that RAM is being written to, it is enabled. Okay, very good. So I hear both of the questions. Okay, so I'm gonna track both of those. So when you are doing this on your own, you should probably, you know, I would recommend you to kind of document the whole thing using a piece of paper or something because, you know, I would have problem tracking all of these things. So we want to know, you know who connects to RAM.A, which specifies which location to update, and also you know, who connects to RAM.B, who specifies the new value of that of said location. Yes, that's lawyer talk, talk right there. <laughs> Going to law school can be very helpful, not only to make money, but to understand understanding the law can be very helpful in life, or just in general. Yep. All right. So we got two questions. Okay. We'll track down each one individually. And that's why it is important to write it down. Because if I did not write this down, I would have forgotten the second question by the time I fully answered the first one. Okay. So we'll answer the first one like, who connects to RAM.A? Okay, so let's go ahead and try to figure that out. I think most of you have a general idea of you know how it is connected, but we're going to track it down anyway. All right, so we are tracking down the A port. Okay, we track down this wire. It comes out of the multiplexer, the same multiplexer that we saw earlier, but this time the select is a zero, which means input zero connects to the output of this multiplexer. It only comes comes from one place, which is another D multi, which is a D multiplexer. Sorry, this is a D multiplexer. 
the demultiplexer's output zero is connecting to the input zero over here, and the select is a zero. So that's good because you know, that means the output here is connected to output zero over here. So now we have to track down who is connected to out one. So now we go into the register bank. Out one is this output pin. So now we have to track down this wire. It is coming out of a demultiplexer. This multiplexer has a select of one one, which means you know, this input is connected to this output here. This input connects ultimately to the output of D. So D dot Q connects to RAM dot A, you know, at this point. So now that I have tracked everything down, I'm going to make a note of it. Okay. So now I say, uh, give me a second, let me write this down first. D dot Q connects to RAM dot A. So that means we are dereferencing based on register D. Yeah, go ahead. Location, who is telling me which location is being updated? And since we are overwriting that location with something, who is providing the value to override that location? So, one way to answer to, to address what you asked, okay, so let me kind of segue a little bit here first, okay, to address that question. So, one thing you can do is to go through every single port of RAM and ask. In this operation, now that we know RAM is being selected, okay, it's enabled, and we are writing to it, what is the role of the A port? What is the role of the D port? So once you think about those two, then you would naturally would be able to ask those questions that I asked. So in other words, do a scan, okay? This is, I know, you know for those of you who, take, who are taking cybersecurity, you, know, you would say, but that term has a different meaning. Yes, it has a different meaning in cybersecurity, but I'm going to say anyway, we'll do a port scan. <laughs> in other words, you know, we know if we know a thing is enabled, then we do a port scan and ask, what is the role of this port when this thing is enabled and we are writing? What is the role of the D port you know, when we know the RAM is selected and we're writing to it? What is the role of the clear port? Why is it zero? Because we don't want to clear content of the entire RAM. We are still running the program. Um, the clock is a, is, a, is a dark green because you know, we have not you know, clicked to a control key yet. Okay, so that's why it's dark green. So you can do a port scan and try to figure out what each pin is doing. And then you ask, oh, but this pin has a special meaning. What, you know, who is driving? Who is connected to this pin? So that's you know, one way to kind of answer that. To, to, that's one way not to answer the question. This is one way to come up with the question to ask when you know something is being updated or addressed or enabled. All right, so getting back to our analysis. And I cannot remember where we were, but that's okay because that's, that's the reason why I wrote everything down because I cannot remember what we were at. All right. That's okay, because now I remember. We, we just figured out that we are using register D to determine what location we are changing in RAM. Okay, so I'm putting an asterisk here because we are dereferencing. The use of this symbol means you know, the output of register D connects to the A port of RAM. Is that okay? So if you were having some uh, problem understanding what a pointer is, in CISP 360, I hope this helps to clarify. Does that help to clarify? Because you know, whatever you're pointing to, it simply means, oh, that thing eventually is connected to the A port of RAM and telling me which location of the RAM we want to access. Now, it can be a read operation, it can be a write operation, but dereferencing simply means, oh, use this value and use it to control RAM so that you know, it ultimately selects the location in RAM that we are trying to access, okay? All right, so now we try to answer the second question, who is providing the value to you know, the D port of RAM? Okay, so that part is just you know, tracking down the maze. 
right here. Okay, so we try to track this down and say, okay, who is specifying the content of the D point? So with this one, you kind of have to go through all the connection points. Okay, this is not a point where it can specify a value, so we can ignore that. This one potentially can do it. Um, this one cannot do it because this is an input port of a register. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. I did not mean to click that. I meant to click on the other one, which is this one here. This is also just an input. This is also just an input. So neither of those can actually specify a value. Of all the connection points, only the output of this, the multiplexer, can potentially be an output. And this demultiplexer is enabled, okay? Because you know, register output zero enabled is bright green, so it is enabled. So now the next question is, uh, we better make sure that it is selecting output two. Oh, okay, it is selection output two. So that means input, the input of this demultiplexer connects to output two of the same demultiplexer, which connects to ram.d. So the next thing we need to ask is, um, who is specifying the value of out zero from the register bank? So now we go into the register bank, and then we go like, okay, this is the wire that we need to track down. It is coming from a multiplexer. The multiplexer has a select of zero one. So that means input one of the multiplexer connects to the output of this multiplexer. And that's coming out of B.Q, which is the value of register B. Okay. So after this, you know, we kind of go back to our notes here, and then we just go like, okay, we just figure out, you know, what is connected to RAM.D. So now we say uh, B.Q connects to RAM.D. So between these two, now we can make a conclusion and go like, oh, okay. So whatever register D is pointing to is going to be updated to the value of register B, which was what we intended to do to begin with. Can we do okay so far with this? All right. So once again, the approach or the process of how to figure out all of this is more important than the actual result of the analysis. Why? Well, for one simple reason, because we already knew what it was about to do. Okay, that's the documentation. It says what it is supposed to do. The tracking down of all of this stuff is trying to explain how it gets done. Okay, the how of how this, how this gets done is more important than what it is doing. Because what it is doing is already described in the optical table. It, you know, it's already there. The why, how it is getting this done is exercising you know, things that we have learned up to this point, and it is also exercising reasoning, okay? And you might say, but tech, this is, a, this is called tax toy processing, which means I won't see this ever again after this class. You're correct about that. So the reasoning skills is not gonna end, okay? You know, do you think you will not need reasoning skills after this class? You're going to need more reasoning skills by the time you transfer to a four-year university. So it is all about the skills that you're acquiring. It is not really so much about the knowledge that you're gaining. Knowledge is, I think by this time, you know, is inexpensive, okay? Because of search engines and, you know, chatbots and stuff like that, knowledge is cheap, okay? But the way the, that you can reason, that is not cheap. That's how you can land jobs, okay? If you just tell an employee, I know a lot of stuff, that's not gonna be very helpful. But if you can tell your employer, I know what to do with this knowledge to solve problems, mm, that's worth money, okay? Just wanted to kind of say that. I used to be a hiring manager you know, a long time ago, and you know, the only thing I cared about was you know, can somebody solve problems? What they already know, it's not really that important to me. All right, so we are now gonna observe you know, that location in RAM getting updated, okay? So we're gonna see this zero, zero change to um, four, two, okay? The meaning of, what was it? 
the meaning of life? No. I know, but you know, what is what, 42 is the answer to which question? Like the meaning of life and everything in the universe. Is and everything in the world. universe, right? It's not just life. Yeah. It is the, it's the answer to everything. Yeah. Yeah. That but that's 42 in but that's 42 in decimal, which makes it um, 2a in hexadecimal. <laughs> yes, I have to be, I have to spoil that a little bit. There you go. Here's 42. RAM is updated. All right. So your lab today also has the third instruction, which is the LD instruction. The LD instruction is quote unquote the opposite of the store instruction. The store instruction is saying, tell me which location we need to update and tell me which register provides the value to update you know, that location. The other one is exactly the opposite. Okay, it is in the form of you know, some register is, uh, I'll, I'll just go to the off the table. Because I cannot remember which one is X and which one is Y. Yes, this is my processor, and yet I cannot remember which way is which way. Okay, so when we look at LD, it is exactly the opposite. Y is still the pointer, but it specifies the location in RAM so that the content at the addressed location is updating whatever X is. They can be the same register, okay, but they can also be different registers. Y has to be register A to D, X also has to be register A to D. But the process of doing this is about the same as what I just did, okay? Is, you know, at this point, the key, the most important thing for you guys to do is to figure out how this is done, okay? We know what it is going to do already. The question is, how does it get done? All right. So I'm not going to go into the detail for this one, okay, because I think between the LDI instruction that I talked about first and the ST instruction that I talked about second, this one is not difficult to figure out, okay? You know, the direction is a little bit different between, you know, which is who is outputting and who is inputting. But other than that, the analysis is going to be about the same. It is using, you know, basically the same components as the ST instruction. All right, so how do you guys study for this class? <laughs> I, I ask that as a question as in I really don't know the actual answer, okay? I, I'm not asking it because I already know the answer. I just want to see if you, you know the answer. Because different people, I think, will study it for this class different things. If you're one of those you know, super hands-on people and one of my children is super hands-on, those people would be going to the logic sim, okay, that's my logic sim, right here. They'll be going here and then they'll be doing what I did in this class with many different instructions and do it several times and jot down some notes and go like, okay, I see the connections. Um, other people who are less you know, hands-on but more kind of analytical, they would just stare at this diagram and go like, hmm, if I want to make a connection between this and that, you know, how do I configure the multiplexers and the demultiplexers in the process to make that connection? Or is it even possible to have that connection? Because some connections are not possible. There's simply no pathway between certain things, okay? So um, that's kind of how we study, okay? By replicating what I just did in this class on your own without following the steps that I did, but just you're going like, okay, I want to figure out how the LD instruction works, okay? And just gonna fast track to the, uh, right after decoding the LD instruction and doing the same analysis that I just did, that is studying, okay? You know, for this portion of the class. Is that okay? So in very, in some really strange ways, there's no way I can actually write about this because, and there's no need for me to write about it, because how things get done is determined entirely by what you're seeing here. And also the content of the ROM. The content of the ROM is really the key of understanding how things work. 
Now, do you really want to separate 1503982 into the 26 individual bits and figure out which one goes where? The answer is no. There's no need to do it. This is the reason why I have all of these tunnels, okay? So the name of the tunnel is helping you to understand, oh, okay, so it doesn't matter which bit we're talking about. We just know that this bit is going to register output demultip demultiplex. So uh, register output zero demultiplex is related to output zero of the register bank. So it's going to be somewhere around here. And here we go, okay? This is register output demultiplexer. It is being used as the select of this demultiplexer, which basically controls the where is output zero from the register bank going to. It has three possible destinations. This is one possible destination. This is another des possible destination. And this is the last destination. The last output here is not connected, which means it doesn't go anywhere. Okay? So I, this is the best I can describe as to you know what to do to understand this portion of this class. Now, this portion is really important because if we don't understand how things get done inside the processor, the instructions become much more difficult to understand, like what you can and what you cannot do with the instructions. So with an understanding of what is underneath the processor, then it, you will get a better, better understanding of, oh, okay, so if we have this C code to, to translate into assembly code, this, these are things that are possible, these are things that are not possible. So for things that are not possible, I have to break it down into even smaller steps. So that's why you know, this portion is gonna be important. Um, for those of you who want to become, um, if you want to design the next generation of AI chips, like you know, what NVIDIA and um, there's a company in San Diego who's also doing the same thing, Qualcomm. So Qualcomm is also trying to get into the neural net you know, chip you know, market. If you want to be hired as a en computer engineer, you know, which those are the people who actually design the chips, this is basically you know, the, the most fundamental step that you need to understand of what is happening underneath a GPU or CPU or any chipset you know, on your computer. Okay? Um, and this stuff is getting increasingly important. Okay? How many people have a new MacBook, like using the M1 or the M2 chip? Okay? So what are you impressed by your MacBook? But you have no compare, no, nothing to compare to. That's why you're not impressed. Okay, but if you compare that to any HP or Lenovo, you know, it is impressive. Okay, it is impressively fast and efficient, because MacBooks do not have fans. Now, I'm not talking about fans as in fanatics, people who like Apple products. There's no shortage of those, for good reasons. But it doesn't have mechanical fans to cool down the components. Okay, it has conductance to the casing, and that's the only way MacBooks or some of the MacBooks dissipate the heat, which means it doesn't generate a lot of heat to begin with, because otherwise that would not be possible. I mean, my Lenovo here has two exhaust, okay? If you look at the back and hear this thing you know, roar when it is he under heavy load, you would think that you're looking at an F35 taking off. F35 is the latest and greatest you know, fighter jet you know, from the United States. It has you know, two gigantic exhaust tails in the back. So why is that the case? Because the M1 is a fully integrated chip. The memory, the RAM, is on the same physical die as the rest of the processor. The rest of the processor is a, is a RISC architecture. RISC stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computing, as opposed to CISC, which, which stands for Complex Instruction Set Computer. This Lenovo uses a CISC architecture, which is, you know, to most people, it means x86, okay? The x86 architecture is considered a CISC architecture. The RISC architecture would be just about everything else, okay? On your cell phone, um, if, you, if it uses a Qualcomm chip or a deriv derivative of a Qualcomm chip, it uses the ARM chip. And the Apple M1 and M2 chips 
they also make use of the ARM chip, okay, or the ARM you know, processor. So the thing about you know, CISC is it has a lot more transistors, okay, because it has backward compatibility all the way back to the 8086 computer, okay. That is the kind of computer that not your parents used. It would be probably close to your grandparents, okay. And it maintains backward compatibility all the way back, so it has to use a lot of transistors to make that happen. The more transistors you have, the more heat it's going to generate, and as a result, you, you also need to, it uses a, a more juice, okay? If you were to run the computer on just the battery, it's not going to last very long with a CISC computer. But with an M2-based you know, you know, MacBook, how long do you get you know, when you're on battery? Hmm? A few days. A few days. A few days. If I'm not like, if I'm not on it all day, yeah, it could last. Yeah, I'll be lucky to have like two or three hours. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding you. I can watch that number go like, yeah. and I'm not even gaming. All I'm doing is just using the browser. Okay, teaching this class. Hmm? But the gaming laptops are ridiculous. <clears throat> how much power they go through? Yeah. Well, they have you. Know, tr they try to use different ways to reduce the power consumption. But because it is not a vertical integration, they are still using chips manufactured by other people, so they can only have so much control over, you know, the possible ways to optimize your know, power consumption. So, so who does all the integration? You know, of, you know, oh, we want to pull all the RAM and the GPU and the CPU and all of these peripheral chips, and I think we can fit all those into a die. So who who gets that done? It's not the computer science people, okay? It is not the electrical engineers, okay? Because those guys are much more, they're, they're busy trying to figure out, oh, can, how many transistors can we fit into a tiny little area? But what are those your transistors doing? Are they, being, are they serving as NAND gates? Are they serving as AND gates? Are they doing this you know, register thing? They don't care. They just want to figure out how to pack as many transistors as possible into a tiny little area. So the people who are determined go like, I think if we can fit more stuff, it makes sense to fit RAM into the same die, onto the same die, because you know, the communication between the processor and RAM is, you know, is one, it is performance related, and two, um, the, the, it also makes routing easier for the, for the circuit boards, okay? So those would be the computer engineers, okay? So computer engineering, has its importance because you know we want to reduce power consumption, we want to reduce the packaging of things, okay, and we also want to find more innovative ways of arranging the gates and whatnot in order to get things done as quickly and using as little energy as possible. Energy is a big thing. I know we are running out of time, and this does not seem to relate to this class, but it does. I just read an article today that Google is joining many other companies who are big in AI um, in terms of proposing or trying to get its own nuclear plant, power plant. I'm not kidding you, okay? You would think this is like science fiction, right? You know, okay, the next movie is gonna talk about how the, these you know, AI companies trying to use nuclear plants. Nope, just look up Google nuclear plant. New, new nuclear clean energy agreement with Kairos Power. Okay, but this is you know, not um, Google itself. There we go, BBC. Now, I know BBC cannot be trusted for certain things, but you know, this is technical stuff, okay? You know, it's, it's not really up for debate, and there's no prospective issue here. Google has signed a deal to use small nuclear reactors to generate the vast amounts of energy needed to power its artificial intelligence data centers. I'm not kidding you. Okay? And I think this is what is going to be in our future. Uh, fusion reactors will become reality. The Navy, the U.S. Navy, was the main proponent behind fusion, or you know, small fusion reactors, because instead of using fission reactors in the you know, carriers and and submarines and whatnot, they want to use fusion instead of fission, because fusion does not uh, give us as much you know, nuclear toxic you know, toxic waste, 
So they used to be the, the, the motivation behind um, research in uh, fusion reactors. But I think the, the dynamics has just shifted. I think these big tech companies are now going to be the main proponent of you know, powering up you know, all the research to make fusion reactors a reality. We used to think it's not possible. Yeah. So specifically, when you think of the uh, Microsoft Microsoft Surge and the Google Surge, do you feel like how that happened? Yeah. So Microsoft and uh, Google, you know, probably Apple, you know, they're all on this boat because you know, they, they need so much energy, you know, the conventional way of generating energy is no longer, you know, sustainable. You know, people who buy, you know, Teslas because they think it's clean, well, guess what? It's not so clean anymore. Because the reason why they were clean before is because, you know, you can use the excess energy at night to charge your car because power plants cannot just go like, oh, there's no need using power today or, you know, during this hour, I'm just, I'm just going to, disable or turn off the entire power plant. They cannot do that, okay? The generator has to keep running, but as long as they're running, there's power produced. And the power produced has to go somewhere because if it doesn't go anywhere, the generator itself is gonna burn out. So they go like, how about this? You guys just charge your Tesla when you're sleeping and nobody else is using the energy. That is not true anymore because all the AI data centers is running 24-7, 365. <laughs> And the amount of energy they are using makes charging the Tesla cars a drop in the bucket. Yep. So now we are not using solar. We're not using wind. We're going back to you know, things that have you know, carbon emission because you know, we need that power 24-7. We cannot wait until there's wind. We cannot wait until there's sun. You know, we have to keep those you know, AI data centers running all the time. So anyway, just kind of interesting perspective stuff. You know, these are all factual. There's nothing fictional about what I just talked about. So if you think about this, this is the kind of future that you guys are walking into. So you know, when you're thinking about occupation, your know, career paths, you know, these are all factors that you kind of have to consider as you think about, hmm, what do I want to do? What, where are the jobs? What do people want to do? What do these corporations want to accomplish? So those are all kind of important stuff. All right, so I am going to give you the um, lab right now. So let me go back to the lab. Okay. So today's lab, you know, as I said, is going to exercise the LD, ST, and the LDI instruction. Um, there's a little bit of this that talks about labels, but it is described in the lab itself. Okay, so that's why the labs are actually quite important because there's actual instruction embedded into the lab too. So this is your lab and the um, pass code, access code is ECPASM, all in uppercase. Oh, nope, I take it's it not, back. Not it's LDI. <laughs> it's LDI in lowercase. There we go. All right. So <laughs> it is already published. If you refresh, you should be able to see it. And today is the 15th. Yep. I am going to stop the recorder.